Look, you're not fooling anybody. You're trying to stop me from giving the answer. <laughs> so let okay, me give Kurt, you the answer. This is a little nutty. So, I got to be honest. Who are you trying to get crazy with this thing? Don't you know I'm local? You hear me? I'm not insane! This is not reality, not reality, not reality. This is reality. All hail the man called Calamity. Bad luck personified. The answer to the age-old riddle, what would happen to your life if you had sex with that black cat under a ladder? Well, I'll tell you what. You'd be Kurt Eichenwald. You can say what you want about the boys at Blizzard, but look at that reflection mapping. Or ambient occlusion. These are all technical terms. I don't know what any of it means. But it looks like the sun's directly above him. It's almost realistic. You could reach out and touch that. Now, Kurt, well, he's the sort of man that doesn't settle for second best. Most people would take a horrific embarrassment happening to them and call it quits. That's where they draw the line. They've achieved all they want to achieve in the realm of making themselves look like a jackass. But not Kurt. He's got that Goku get him attitude. That one's for you, buddy. I know you'll appreciate it from one weeb to another. Don't worry, I'm going to pack more of them in there. We'll get to that later. Now, Kurt, he doesn't settle for second best. He's going to keep overachieving. He's going to have that drive to move forward. There's always another bar to grab at. And he will outdo himself time and time and time again. But to really understand the story of Kurt and the catastrophes which surround him, we have to go all the way back to the beginning. Because who exactly is this man? And where did he get his start? So why don't you have a seat right over there? And let's begin. For five years, beginning when I was 13 years old, I operated a pornographic website featuring images of myself loaded on the internet by webcams. I was paid by more than a thousand men to strip naked, masturbate, and even have sex with female prostitutes while on camera. That young man giving testimony before the commission is Justin Berry, someone who found himself lured into the insidious side of the internet, a then young teenage boy who thought his webcam would be a means to meet new people, to make friends online, and to be able to reach out to others with common interests to help take care of the loneliness he felt in his day-to-day -day life. Instead, he found himself the focus of people who wanted to exploit him. As time went on and his interactions with these men continued, the request they were giving him to simply do a stream or to put himself on webcam with only his shirt off morphed into more and more extreme and explicit sexual acts. As the years went by, the relationship he had with his abusers moved past purely a entertainer-customer relationship into that of a business partner, opening up websites such as Justin Friends to continue his streaming service. Justin Berry's story first came to light through the New York Times and the reporting of Kurt Eichenwald. Within his report, Kurt recounts how he first met Justin, his attempts to bring Justin away from this group of people, to get him to go forward to law enforcement, to bring evidence against the men that exploited him, to hopefully get charges brought and to get convictions so that these same people could not prey on other children. Through Kurt's reporting and his actions, he was able to get Justin to do just that. The story went national. It became a big piece of news. It won Kurt an award. All was looking well for Eichenwald. It was something to hang his hat on. He had saved a young man who was formerly a child porn star, brought about the beginnings of justice to get child pornographers and exploiters and molesters brought before the courts. Just another in a long line of successful stories that Kurt had written over the span of his career. An investigative reporter, a journalist who had a reputation for being detail-oriented and meticulous with what he did. And it was that mindset and that consistency on Kurt's part that won him the accolades of his peers. And yet it wasn't long after this report was published within the Times that issues began to crop up around Kurt and his relationship to the story, particularly the source, Justin Berry. Numerous outlets began to report on inconsistencies on how Kurt had conducted his investigation as well as his relationship with this subject matter. Actions which seemingly went against the ethics policy and the standards and principles laid out at the New York Times as well as numerous other papers when it comes to how a journalist interacts with a story. One of the first issues to be raised within a year of this article going up was the fact that Kurt had paid Justin Berry money. It came out that Kurt had written a check to Justin for $2,000 
something which the paper, the New York Times, prohibits. And yet Kurt said that it was a honest mistake. It was even more than an honest mistake. He had stated that he had met Justin, and a month before he even decided to write an article about Justin or his line of work, he had decided to give him $2,000 to get his life in order, that it was a personal loan that would be paid back to him, which it was. And yet he only neglected to mention this because he was under a deadline. He was working 15 to 18 hour days, seven days a week to get this story compiled. And so it conveniently slipped his mind. When news that Kurt had paid money to Justin Berry, the source of the story, came out, the New York Times responded. It was put out there that this was a honest mistake, that it didn't affect the investigation, it didn't affect the reporting, and it didn't affect the important nature of what Kurt had written about. That this was the only mistake and the only payment that had been made. $2,000, perhaps another $10 payment, but that was it. There was no more money. Justin Berry had been cut a check for $2,000 and not a penny more except for the other $1,100 that Kurt neglected to mention, a amount that was paid not just to Justin Berry, but to Justin Berry's business associate, the man that was running the website with him, a man who was later charged and convicted. That $1,100 payment wasn't disclosed until the court case began to proceed. And what was Kurt's response to that? Well, that's when he brought up epilepsy. Kurt went on to explain that this was a medical condition that he had and that it affected his memory, and he had kept it a closely guarded secret. So the first time he had cut a check for $2,000 was before the story even took place. It was a personal business loan, which he simply forgot about. The second time he had paid $1,100. It was an epileptic fit, which wiped his memory out, and he didn't remember it at all. Even though when you look at the reporting around the issue, it seems that Kurt was taking measures to make sure that it didn't get connected back to him, since the money was paid through PayPal, under different pseudonyms. Stranger still is when you begin to look at the timeline of how that money affected Justin Berry's activities, as well as other allegations that came out as reported per NPR. In January of 06, the Times received an email from Mitchell's mother. That was a man that was later convicted, the man that helped run Justin Friends with Justin Berry. Among her accusations was that Eichenwald had fed exed several thousand dollars to help fund Berry's website. Eichenwald blew off the accusation, calling it, quote, a crappy lie. The NPR coverage of the Eichenwald story and the subsequent fallout from it raises some interesting questions. Why was it that after twice being shown to be inconsistent with the truth, whether that was a lie of omission, an intentional lie, or an impaired memory, why is it once all that information had come out that the New York Times didn't go back and look at the email they received from a man directly connected to the case, from his mother, saying that Eichenwald had personally paid thousands more to get Justin Berry to open up another website. Now that other website, the Justin Friends one, why is that so key to this entire story? Well, a Gawker article might actually shine some light onto that. This is back from 2007. Kurt Eichenwald has some explaining to do. In the article, it goes over the details about the initial $2,000, which wasn't mentioned and it sets forward a timeline. Now there are a few key pieces of information that come forward from this that tie back into the money that Eichenwald had given Barry. The first being that JustinFriends.com suddenly became active again. This website, which had existed but was completely defunct at this point, suddenly goes active once more, and it goes active once more after the money was received from Eichenwald by Justin Barry. Now the second more contentious piece of information that comes to light from this particular article as relating back to Justin Friends is that after the website became active once more, Justin puts on several shows. These are legal. Justin is almost 19. He also uploads videos of himself when he was 17 as well as a video of him masturbating with an underage boy named Taylor. This is a frequent claim by a person who claims to be a business partner of Justin Berry, Timothy Ryan Richards, or his supporters. Richards was convicted in October 2006 of distribution of child pornography, as well as other counts. It is unverifiable. When you gather together all these different sources, all the reporting that's been done about Kurt Eichenwald, about the New York Times, and the story on Justin Berry, details begin to emerge which cast a, a cloud of doubt over the integrity of the story and the people involved with it. When looking at this information and parsing through it, you're confronted with numerous facts. Those being that Kurt Eichenwald made numerous payments to Justin Berry. 
These payments were made through a number of different methods under a number of different names. Eichenwald gave different excuses for why that was never disclosed. Within 10 days of receiving that money, a site that's run by Justin Berry, as well as a business associate who would later be convicted for child pornography, suddenly becomes active again. Another defendant who was convicted as well for child pornography alleges that once the site became active, within a few days, videos of underage boys engaged in sexual activities were put up and were viewable by members of the website. When you look at that sequence of events, and you take Kurt Eichenwald's statement at the beginning of this, that this was a month before he had any interest in writing a story about this, and within two to three weeks of having given that money to Justin Barry, a website is now up and active and distributing, or allegedly distributing, child pornography. It makes one wonder, it calls into question the integrity of the people involved. Other outlets, such as truthrevolt.org, follow this up with even more information. For those of you that have never heard of this website, it's one that was founded by David Horowitz and Ben Shapiro. That will be funny for another reason later on in the video. Newsbusters notes that even outlets like NPR ultimately found horrifying details, such as an account believed to have been from Eichenwald, had high-level administrative access to the child porn site Justin Friends, which would have allowed him to closely monitor the site's business. And it would seem that even at the time this was taking place in the subsequent years after the article went up, numerous outlets had qualms about what was happening. I think, though, that NPR really helps to highlight this by listing out what they call three primary questions for the Times. Does the Times now plan on having Eichenwald's reporting during his tenure at the paper verified in light of the additional undisclosed payments he made to Barry? Does the Times plan to investigate if the money Eichenwald gave Barry was used by Barry to operate the website merely to generate a story? Does the Times plan to investigate, or has it investigated, why Ingracia declined to confirm the veracity of the email that accused Eichenwald of both exchanging funds with Barry and potentially funding Barry's web operation. But I think the most damning question, and the most pertinent one, is that second one. Was the money used to operate the website merely to generate a story? Take a moment to look at the details of everything surrounding this, of everything that's been reported about it. Eichenwald meets a young man. He gives him money. And seemingly a month later, he has a story about child pornography, about a website, about a former performer, and about men that are going to be arrested. If Eichenwald had not given Justin Barry the money, and that money had not been used to restart the website, and Barry had not continued on with his activities, would there have been any arrests? Would there have been any distribution of child porn? Would there have been an active child pornography website? Did the Times, did Kurt Eichenwald, do this merely to generate a story. Now, these are merely questions. I'm not making any definitive declarative statements. I want to be very clear on that. I am just asking questions. So there you have Kurt Eichenwald, the only man in history who could rescue a child porn star, write a story that leads to arrest, and still find some way to fuck that up and look bad afterwards. But that's a trend which Kurt has continued onward for many years to come. Because if there is one thing Kurt is an expert at, it is making Kurt look bad. I just had a seizure. Wow, that was a bad one I owe, the pain of seizures. I have seizure pain. I have pain from the seizure. Ma'am, that was not a seizure, that was a dance move. December 15th, 2016 was a bad day to be Kurt Eichenwald. And it is a pity because it held such promise. Kurt was excited. He was going to be on Tucker Carlson that evening at 7 p.m. And while Kurt would leave a memorable impression on the audience, it probably wasn't the impression he was hoping to go for. Instead of the reputable journalist with a long storied history of writing investigative pieces that delve into issues people are interested in, he came off as, how, how can I put this gently, batshit insane. Now, the entire segment was 10 minutes long, and I would love to show the entirety of it to you, but I don't think Fox News will oblige me in allowing me to play the entire clip uninterrupted. So I've taken highlighted segments to try to give you an idea of just how badly this went. Things began to go downhill about two to three minutes into the interview, when Tucker Carlson is reading back statements that Kurt had made on social media, namely one concerning Donald Trump being institutionalized in a mental hospital. 
But the next day, you say, quite ironically, and I'm quoting, I believe Trump was institutionalized in a mental hospital for a nervous breakdown in 1990, which is why he won't release his medical records. This would devolve into at least five minutes of straight theatrics, as Kurt did everything in his power to dodge giving an answer to the simple question which Tucker repeatedly asked him. And was he in a mental hospital in 1990, as you allege, Let or was he not? Let me answer the question. Go ahead. You are... Look, you're not fooling anybody. You're trying to stop me from giving the answer. <laughs> now that is impressive. You might not see bullshittery like that outside of a used car lot. But Kurt was actually able to take Tucker saying, go ahead, give me your answer, and turn that around into, you're not letting me answer the question. But he wasn't done there. Okay, so I think let's that go you're humiliating to, yourself by uh, your unwillingness to it, answer a simple question. So please answer it. Last I am time. trying to answer the Do question. Do you have evidence he was in a mental hospital unlike in on your world, don't you? reality is not always able to give you a yes or no answer. Well, let's hop aboard the crazy train then and take that fucker all the way down to imagination land. Because apparently reality isn't going to allow Kurt to give us a coherent answer. Now this farce continued on for a good five solid minutes, inevitably leading Tucker to have to ask him another one. And and nobody's getting fooled. You're trying to How stop. can Newsweek employ you as a reporter, Kurt, when you're throwing <laughs> lines like this around that are untrue, that you can't substantiate, when you say to the president's Tucker, spokesman, you just F not, you, well, you, that's not you, the behavior uh, of a look, reporter. Okay. Which is fairly sound. How could he be employed by Newsweek? How could he tweet out a public statement talking about a president-elect being institutionalized in a mental hospital and then refuse to expand on that? or to simply say, yes, that's true, or no, that is untrue. But if you thought that was bizarre, you haven't seen anything yet. Kurt wanted to kick it up a notch. He wanted to pull a bit of an emerald. He wanted to take that nutty and bring it all the way up to a nutty buddy. How about Begging this? I'm going to give you 30 answer seconds to answer this question. Do you have evidence that he was institutionalized no, in a mental hospital in 1990? Still on 30 the seconds. Table. Now, okay, I will say this, because it's a message I've got from people from the CIA. Uh... I know a lot of officers, I know a lot of agents, I've been in their homes, and they're really delivering this to you and to Donald Trump. Uh, these are people who have sacrificed a lot for this country. Look at, look at his face. Look at that expression. That's the expression you get when you're sitting next to a fucking crazy person on the bus in the city. That is the expression you get when you are in a confined area and you're thinking to yourself, what's the nearest window I can jump out of before this person tries to stab me with a needle? It's, it's all in the eyebrows. He's communicating, he's communicating with those eyebrows that he's getting perhaps a little, a little scared. I have, con right I'm starting to get, have concerns have about you, Kurt. Right Just now, tell me what the, the secret message from the CIA is. Of course, much like the earlier question of, did you say this and is it true? Kurt's not going to give a clear answer on this one either. Instead, he's just going to keep freaking Tucker out to the point where he starts to express concerns about his well-being on a nationally televised news program. We're out of time, Kurt, and, and I, I don't mean this I. in a, in a cool way. I, I would have real concerns if liars, I were one of your editors, and I mean news. that. I'm not calling anyone a liar, but I am it's saying despicable. I'm concerned about your behavior on this show tonight. Now, I'm sure you can imagine the reception that Kurt had waiting for him upon arriving back on his Twitter account after the interview had concluded. It would be putting it mildly to say that people were enjoying themselves, tearing into him. And he didn't help matters much by trying to elaborate on the message the CIA had given him to pass along to Tucker Carlson. Good old Kurt Eichenwald, said by his peers to be meticulous and detail-focused, forgot to write it down. Oops, you know that super-secret message from the Central Intelligence Agency, forgot to write that down. Even though I had a giant binder when I was on your show from analyzing everything you said so I could bring it up to argue with you about, the message from the CIA directly to you, though, forgot to scribble that one down. Maybe it was up on the fridge next to bills that were due at the end of the month, and I, I just tossed it out without thinking about it. It's probably in the garbage with the cable bill. But to have a truly terrible day, you need more than one thing to go wrong. You need at least three of them. And here's number two. Amidst the fallout from the Tucker Carlson interview, as people were digging into him and mocking him for looking like an asshat, Sebastian Jones, a freelance journalist, decided to dredge up the entire Justin Berry situation, linking to previous articles and discussing inconsistencies with Kurt's reporting and questions that still surrounded what had happened. So there Kurt is, in the middle of a miniature shitstorm, one that he's helped to fuel with his appearance on television with questions about his past being dredged up, 
all of these horrible things being said by these mean, mean people on social media are all happening at once. What could possibly make it worse? I know. How about a seizure? Replying to Jew Goldstein. This is his wife. You caused a seizure. I have your information, and I called the police to report the assault. As if Kurt's luck wasn't bad enough on the 15th, he was memed in the first degree, so terribly so, that he was on the floor shitting himself and seizing, and his wife had to take over his Twitter account to let everybody know about it. No, she didn't focus on her husband and his medical emergency. She wasn't holding his hand or telling the kids to get the car to come around. She was making sure all his Twitter followers knew that he was having an epileptic fit. She made sure to update everybody on his status. Wanted to give those real-time updates, the things that people are really concerned about. His health can wait. His Twitter followers need the deets immediately. Now, this tragic event led Kurt to get in contact with law enforcement, with the FBI, with a lawyer, to subpoena Twitter to get the information of the user who had done this. And while the case was moving forward to identify this individual, to strip them of their anonymity, to arrest them for giffing somebody on Twitter, Kurt did the media tour. He went on Good Morning America to discuss the horrific events of that evening. Oh, uh, apparently, I can't look at my Twitter feed anymore, but apparently um, a lot of people find this very funny. Now, the man responsible, John Rain Ravioli Ravioli Rivioli, doesn't sound very Jewish. Maybe Goldstein is just a nickname his friends at college called him. He was arrested and charged and put on a $100,000 bail and was facing federal prosecution for cyber-stalking. However, those charges were dropped. He still does face one count of assault with a deadly weapon in Dallas County, a charge that carries a hate crime enhancement. On top of that, Kurt is suing him for monetary damages. While it may be a while before we see the final outcome of this case, and if giffing somebody on the internet is going to send you to prison, one thing does sort of stick out, and that is, once again, the convenient epilepsy coming to save Kurt from embarrassment or ridicule. Much like the case with Justin Berry, where he was having memory lapses to explain away the improprieties of paying a source, after Kurt had gone on national television and a disastrous appearance on Tucker Carlson, he suddenly was gift and had an epileptic fit leading to a seizure, which changed the news cycle. And that's not to say that Kurt doesn't have epilepsy, or that the epilepsy he may have triggers seizures. That is just to say that it is a remarkable coincidence. Of course, Kurt Eichenwald is a very remarkable individual. What other word could exist to help to describe a man who would go through the arduous research process of looking up tentacle porn to show his family? I like to build a world aside and furnish it with porn. Draw hentai pics and girls with dicks and tentacles galore. The seventh started out like any other day for Kurt on social media. He was doing his damnedest to make himself look like a fool in front of as many people as possible. On this particular day, he was trying to prove the validity of something he said was sent to him. It was a flyer warning about the Jews. But how could he go about that? People were doubting what he was telling them. And so Kurt, being the meticulous and detail-oriented type of person that he is, decided the best way to prove that he had this particular item, that this was sent to him in real life, was to pull out his phone and take a screen cap of it. So he held up that pamphlet right against his computer monitor and he snapped a picture. Now, for most people that browse the internet, be it an image board or a forum, you've probably come across a form of a meme, a, a joke that's floating out there, and maybe you've wondered why that exists. Who could possibly be so foolish as to do the following? The joke usually takes a form of somebody taking a screenshot of their desktop to point something out to other users at the community they're a part of. But included in that screenshot is a little more information than they were really willing to share. They slightly overlooked it. But who could really be that foolish? I mean, that's obviously a joke. Nobody would leave tabs open like that and make themselves look like a giant idiot. Well, there's always a basis in reality for everything. Kurt Eichenwald, he is a living example of somebody who did just that. Because if we analyze that picture he uploaded, if we go all CSI on it, you're going to notice something. There's a little tab present in the picture. You've just got to gotta zoom in a little bit. Clean that up. Zoom in a little bit more. What does that say? It looks like somebody, somebody already did the detective work for us. Hey, which tag was it that hooked you, Kurt? Below is the, uh, the expanded version of what was on the tab on Kurt's computer. 
Let's, uh, let's take a look. Let's read through it and see what our journalist extraordinaire has been looking at. B. Chiku, English, Saha Desensored, Male, Dark Skin, Glasses, Schoolboy Uniform, Female, BBW, Big Ass, Big Breast, Bike Shorts, Bikini Blowjob, Defloweration, Face Sitting, Glasses, Impregnation, Milf, Nakadashi, Schoolgirl Uniform, Smell. <laughs> Stockings, swimsuit, teacher, x-ray, Yuri. Hello, my name is Kurt Desu. I love Japan. Well, it would appear that that was some animated pornography, some hentai that Kurt was looking up on his own and he accidentally forgot to close the tab when he screen shared with his thousands of followers. I wonder what explanation he gave people. I'm sure something that was completely normal and reasonable and something that people didn't think was even weirder than the fact that he was sharing his favorite hentais with his followers. Sigh. Okay. I'm a dumbass. Believe it or not, my kids and I were trying to convince my wife that tentacle porn existed. I tried to find some to show her it was real, but I couldn't find any. And I ended up with this. My family reads my Twitter feed so they know this is true. You know, it was just a typical day in the Eichenwald household. Me, my kids, and my wife were all looking up hardcore hentai pornography because they didn't believe it really existed. And even though if you did a, a Google search just for the word tentacle porn, there would be a billion results. I couldn't find any. <laughs> I wasn't able. I wasn't able to find any. And I ended up with this. Well, that's a that's a little strange because when I'm looking at the tags that are included in this particular tweet, Kurt, I don't see anything related to tentacles in it. But maybe I need to pay closer attention to the uh, tags. Maybe let's see if we can puzzle it out. Why why would you have stumbled on this one in your innocent search to show your children tentacle pornography? Well, there's there's nakadashi, which translates to pies. Now I'm not sure what kind of what kind of pies those might be, Kurt. I'm sure they're creamy, but I don't think they're tentacle related. Big brass, no blowjob. I I don't think so. Could it be smell? Could you be smelling the octopus or squid that's coming to gang rape you? I mean, maybe. X-ray? I I don't know. Maybe it's a schoolboy uniform, Kurt. Maybe the schoolboy uniform's what drew you here. You know, in your search for tentacle pornography to share with your family. Within a day's time, Kurt tried a a new tactic after being the object of ridicule for much of the internet and all the people on Twitter having a great laugh at his expense, he hit them with this gem. Even if I was reading Japanese porn, what would be the big deal? I've read porn in my life. Not into cartoons, though. Are you guys Puritans or eight? Stop being so uptight, soccer moms. So what if I like to hang out with the kids and the wife looking up hardcore hentai? That's a, that's a normal red-blooded American thing to do. Like apple pie, or as my honorable friends would say, apple nakadashi. Now, originally, I had planned on leaving this as one long-form video. But Kurt being Kurt has given me so much content to work with, that's nearly impossible because even as I was working on this, even as I was editing it together, Kurt found himself once again in the middle of a miniature shitstorm which he had created. And so because of that, I'll be splitting the video here. I'll have the second part up tomorrow where we'll continue on with the magical adventures of Kurt Eichenwald. Everything from threatening to dox lawmakers, to threatening to sue or blackmail YouTubers, or getting into fight with school shooting survivors. And I'll finally be able to put forward my theory that I call the Kurt Eichenwald J-curve. And trust me when I tell you, we are only just getting started. Kurt has quite a ways down to go, and he is aiming for rock bottom.